brought to you by Head Start Basketball. We identified early on that we would go through existing organizations to reach the coaches in those organizations to have an impact on as many children as we can through the coach. So by and large, everybody bought into the coaching component. And so um, I think you're seeing that now with our coach license program, which we launched in like mid 2015. But if we can educate and train coaches and onboard them and have communication points with them, they're really the people that deliver the game. And everybody got behind that concept. And so that became our first program. Jay Demings joined USA Basketball as Youth and Sport Development Division Director on November 4th, 2013. He arrived at USA Basketball with 16 years of experience in boys and girls basketball and a master's degree in sport leadership from Northeastern University. As the Youth and Sport Development Division Director, Demings oversees all facets of the department, including the development of youth basketball initiatives that address player development, coach education, and safety in sport. Prior to arriving at USA Basketball, Demings served as the Director of Operations for the Boston Amateur Basketball Club in Boston, Massachusetts, where he oversaw all aspects of the nonprofit basketball program. During his tenure, BABC won five national tournament titles as well as the 2012 Victor Rowe International Basketball Tournament in Milan, Italy at the U16 age group. He also organized and directed many youth basketball tournaments. From May of 2011 through August of 2012, Demings was a sport director at Boys and Girls Clubs of America in Warwick, Rhode Island, and he spent the 2009-2010 NBA season with the Boston Celtics as a media and public relations assistant. At Providence Country Day School in East Providence, Rhode Island from 2003 to 2008, Demings served as an assistant athletic director and the varsity girls basketball coach for five seasons. Demings got his start in high school basketball as founder, president, and coach of Rhode Island Premier Basketball from 1998 to 2009, a nonprofit youth program for boys and girls ages 9 through 18. After you're done enjoying this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes, and make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. The Hoop Heads Pod can be found on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube. Share the show with one friend or colleague so we can continue to grow the great game of basketball. Get ready to learn and make sure you take some notes as we dive into a conversation with Jay Demings from USA Basketball. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Quinzling here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome from USA Basketball, Jay Demings. Jay, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We are excited to dive a little deeper into all the great things that you're doing with USA Basketball. And want to get started here, though, by going back in time and talking about how you got into the game of basketball as a kid and what made you fall in love with the game as as a young person. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm getting a little older now, so to recall those years is getting a little <laughs> tougher. But if I remember correctly, um, and I tell this story a lot, so I do remember this. Um, for me, um, it wasn't. I didn't even know I was playing basketball when I first fell in love with the game. It, it probably started the same way it starts for most of us, uh, I would think, um, where you end up like, you know, taking like a sock or, or like um, a piece of paper and either, you know, throwing the sock in a laundry basket or the piece of paper in a waste basket, you know, and um, before you know it, you're, you're, you're kind of making a little bit of a game of it. And then you have a sibling or, or some relative that comes over and tries to block that shot or, you know, knock it <laughs> out the air on you and, and you get frustrated and you try to figure out ways to, to make it happen. And then you get further and further back. And, and before you know it, um, you're playing basketball. And, um, and I think, I think we start very, very early, whether we know it or not. Um, and, and I don't think a lot of sports can say that. Um, but, um, but I didn't actually play organized basketball um, until I got a lot older. So a lot older, uh, relatively speaking, like 13 or 14. So uh, that's the first time I ever went and played on the team. I was that kid that double dribbled out on the playground and didn't know he was doing it, um, but thought he was really good um, <laughs> until I got into somebody put a uniform on me. So um, um, how do I, I was a typical kid where I probably thought I knew more than I actually did. And so I didn't necessarily take coaching that well. So it didn't lead me down the high school path like it did uh, maybe some of my other friends. Um, but then I then I really started to pick it up. And, and so I kind of started to play on my own in different leagues and things like that. Um, 
uh, back then what was called AAU basketball or, you know, travel basketball now mostly, um, wasn't as popular as it was. So if you weren't as good as some of the other players, you didn't have a team you could play on. Um, today you do. Uh, there's a team for every level and every ability, but back then there wasn't. So, um, but I tried working really hard. I, um, I, I went and played uh, before they were actually a college team. They had a club team at Johnson & Wales University in, in Rhode Island. And um, I kind of started playing there um, after a shoulder injury. And the fact that my mom was about um, four foot 11, I decided I was going <laughs> to give it up and uh, get into the coaching side. So, so that's what I did. Gotcha. Did you play other sports growing up? I tried them. Um, I tried soccer. <laughs> I tried baseball. Um, the infamous story is that um, when I tried baseball, I was on a pretty good team. Uh, back then, you could stack teams. So my friend, my neighbor's uh, dad coached the team, and um, he picked me on the team. I wasn't very good. I was pretty fast, but I couldn't hit a ball. Uh, my baseball career ended when um, Scott Monahan, I'll never forget the name, uh, who was bigger than the rest of the kids at <laughs> 11 and 12 years old, uh, drilled me with a pitch from my first year when, you know, they took the TOA, I guess, and um, <laughs> uh, hit me in the back, took off my helmet, gave it back to my uh, friend's dad and said, thank you so much for the opportunity, coach. And then uh, I ended my baseball career. <laughs> back to the hardwood after that, right? I was back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So as you were going through and, and you were growing up, before you gave up your playing career, did you have aspirations or thoughts of coaching at any point while you were still playing or was that something that once you came to the realization that hey my playing career is over I got my shoulder injury I think I'm going to hang up the sneakers was that the point that you started to think about coaching or had you thought about it previously yeah I thought about it previously well I always thought I was a coach because I thought I knew more than any than any <laughs> of the coaches so I like I kind of thought hey I can do what they're doing and um but we, yeah, when my playing career, like my, when I say my playing career, I still played with friends and that I grew up with. Right, and right. Like we all play, but like, so I kept playing, but um, I realized pretty quick that like, let me go back to see if I can teach young people what I didn't learn um, at that same age. So, so I, I went back and I, and I decided to take a small group of like sixth and seventh graders, which is rare, right about where I thought maybe I could have used some better guidance and, and some more like relatable, um, um, coaching. Um, and so I took a small little sixth and seventh grade team and I, and I, in town, like a, like a, like a town league team, you know, like where right, any kid that right. signs up plays. And I just coached in a, in a little league season where they had, you know, everybody plays, rules and um things like that and um to be quite honest i uh i i used to at that point i was only 18 actually 17 when i first took my team i uh i used to try to find a way to circumvent the rules of the league to <laughs> work in my favor so i could you know so if they said it's so, three minutes of playing time i was probably hey i've start. i've seen this guy before jay i've seen this guy you're describing yep yep his name's james sure so, you know, I would, I would, you know, and, and we won and we won some games and, you know, of course, then you become the new guy on the block and uh, this young coach trying to make an impression and, you know, these little, and then plus these kids are, you know, I think that time 10, 11 and 12. So I, um, you know, I thought I was the best coach in the world and, but that's how I got started in it. And then, it, and then I got bitten by the bug. What did you like about it when you first did that? And when you had that experience, what was it about the coaching that you, that you loved? Yeah, I think it was, um, you know, I think it was the opportunity to sort of shape um, the game a little bit. And so like, like you could get, I mean, as strategic as you can get with 11 year olds, you know, you could, you could put them in positions where they were successful. And then, um, so you could see the result of what you were working on. In some cases, obviously they were young, but, um, you know, whether it be that we won a game or that a player made their first shot or that they simply um, got over their nerves about getting on the court for the first time, you, you, you feel a sense of responsibility to the, to, the, to the game, obviously, but to the players most importantly. And I think that that is what uh, made me seek out numerous other coaching opportunities after that. Of course, I was competitive and that was a way to stay competitive too, you know, within basketball. Um, um, but um, yeah, for me, it was, it was you know, um, seeing the results of, of um, the volunteer time that we were putting in because we were all volunteers, you know, back then. Absolutely. So besides circumventing the rules, 
what was something else that you, what was something else that you remember from that first year that first couple experiences coaching that you look back on now and you're like who i don't know if that was really that good of an idea or maybe you're doing something that now you look at it and you're like oh i wish i would have tried this differently back in that time mm -hmm. i think it was my attitude um back then and and by the way that didn't like eradicate for a good decade <laughs> Like, you know, it wasn't Understood. just that year, uh, but it was my attitude toward people who, you know, basically I had this competitive attitude just like I did when I played because I was short. You know, we, we all have that short person syndrome. A lot of us do anyway. And so you you, you feel like um, people are trying to keep you in a box or, or whatever. So when we would win games, you know, I'm talking about a rec league, but like, you know, people would start to say, oh, you need to take it easy on the other team or you need to. And I used to think, well, that person doesn't know what they're talking about. You know, you should try to win by as much as you can and and use every advantage you can. And so if I had to look back at it or when I look back at it now, if I had to do it all over again, if I could, I would I would have changed that part of my um, attitude and realize what we were supposed to be there for, because I don't think I you know, I wasn't mature enough, I guess, to, to be able to understand the responsibility that I was given. So was that a gradual change then, or was that something that you had a moment where you suddenly realized that, you know, something happened and boom, you decided, oh, I got to I got to get this ego in check and realize what the purpose of me being out here is? Or was that something that just kind of gradually changed over time? Um, I think there were two moments where it changed. So I went on to coach um, like a low level club team where I took a couple of kids from like, you know, all those different teams in that league I was coaching in and, and kind of went and played them in quote unquote AAU tournaments. They, you know, um, at that time, um, we lost every game by 70, by the way. So, <laughs> tournament. And so then I went and find, tried to find better players, better teams, whatever. But, but where, and so I went on to coach, I still coached in the league. I coached in Catholic youth league, um, still kind of overly competitive. I was, you know, I still, still was competitive back then. Um, but it changed for me when I started to coach girls basketball for the first time in high school. And it really only changed for me because I was the assistant athletic director at a prep school where I was coaching at the time. And so my job was tied to my attitude. And so, um, yeah, that's when you realize that, oh, actually I have to listen to the people telling me what to, what to do here. And so I, I, I won't, I won't say I softened my stance as a coach, but I, I, um, I gained some perspective, if you will, and and um, and that helped me. And coaching girls actually helped me, and it was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had um, because I realized then that it's not about you know wins and losses. I could still manipulate the game to 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 so that the scoreboard favored us at the end of the day, but it but winning more so in their lives and and off the, you know off the court and you know still some on court wins as well, but more about it's more about the individual athlete than it was about me and, and wins. And, and so it started there. And then when I ended up coaching in, uh, and I was actually the director of operations for the, uh, the Boston Amateur Basketball Club or the BABC, which um, is, is on the Nike EYBL circuit. Um, and uh, we had a pretty high level team. And, and when I realized that my job wasn't about um, winning uh, games or, or trying to become a college coach through you know, by, by utilizing those players to get me there. And it was truly about them and, and their experiences and, and them going on to play in college and, and, and giving them that opportunity. I think those two moments really like shaped me and actually helped me probably get to where I am today as an administrator. Yeah, I think when you're given a chance to have a diversity of experiences, which obviously just from what you described, you've had the opportunity to do. So starting at the youth level and then going to work with girls at the high school level and then going back and, and do it on the EYBL where obviously you're working with some pretty good players at that level that are have aspirations of playing college basketball or even beyond that. I think that diversity of experiences just allows you to be able to gain a different perspective about why you're there. I want to circle back to the girls, to coaching the girls, because that's one of the things that I really had not spent a whole lot of time coaching girls. I coached my daughter, who's now a freshman in high school. I had coached a couple of her lower-level rec games when she was in third, fourth, fifth grade. But I never really coached the girls at a at a higher level. And then as she started playing, and the, the team's not super high level that I'm coaching now with my daughter, but I found it to be super interesting that, like you said, having an impact on their lives, there's so much more, in my experience, the girls – we're so much more receptive to some of those things, especially out of the gate. Like you can get boys to buy in, but it takes a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. And my experience with the girls was just that 
they really, really bonded. And the group that I've been able to put together and been fortunate enough to be a part of uh, has just developed great friendships with for my daughter. And, you know, these are kids that are going to be friends with her for the rest of her life. And that was something that was eye opening for me on the girls side uh, as opposed to the as opposed to the boys. And so it's interesting to hear you say that the girls had a similar impact on you in terms of just how you were approaching the winning versus the impacting lives, you know, both on and off the floor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if you think about that diversity of experiences that you've had and eventually as you go through the process and you are looking around for opportunities, how does the opportunity with USA basketball come to your front door? How do you get that? Uh, how do you get that opportunity? Sure. I, um, well, I can be honest with you. I wasn't looking for it. Um, uh, I know that seems like cliche or whatever. And, um, but, um, looking back, I think I know actually how it came about. And, and, and in all honesty, it was a lot of the experiences that I had gained, um, just by organically staying involved in the game and doing it for the right reasons. And so there wasn't like, um, <clears throat> there wasn't, well, my pathway anyway, it wasn't like a set path. Um, when I, when I um, was debating whether or not I wanted to get into coaching at a higher level, um, that kind of led me to the BABC program. Um, I was also, I went back to uh, school, so I went to grad school at Northeastern at the time, and, and so I went to go get my master's degree in sport leadership, and that led me to the Boston Celtics, where I uh, first interned and then, and then sort of worked, um, uh, f finished out um, our run in uh, 2009, 2010, but I worked in media. And so, um, so I was trying to keep my foot in the coaching door. I was keeping my foot in the administrative side, getting my master's degree in, in hopes that, hey, look, you know, if this coaching thing doesn't work out, <clears throat> you know, it's a tough, it's a tough gig. It's a tough racket, especially if you're looking to get into, let's say, you know, men's division one anyway, um, for even, sure, even, even women's now. Um, so I was trying to kind of keep my foot in different avenues. And so, you know, whether it be media or uh, marketing or whatever. So, um, um, just to stay well-rounded, I thought I could become a college athletic director, if nothing else, you know, work my way up through those ranks. And so as I was going through all of that, um, uh, one thing led to another. I actually took a position at a, uh, as the general manager of a multi-sport complex in uh, Massachusetts. And um, they were they were going through some trials and tribulations for the, for the business. And so um, when I came in, it was like a reclamation project. Um, and I've always found that I, I find reclamation projects or they find me. And if, it's not, <laughs> if it's not a reclamation project, it's a, it's, a, it's a starter project, you know? And so- Gotcha. Um, yeah. And so when I, you know, um, while I was kind of finishing up grad school, I was job hunting and I throw my hat in the ring on a couple of different- um, positions like that, you know, just to stay involved in sports, colleges, um, that, that, that private facility job and USA basketball was a job that had kind of come up. And, um, to be honest, when the, when the position was posted, it was very ambiguous. It was, uh, it was called a youth program director. Um, I think it was director, it might even been coordinator or something at the time, but, um, I found out it was ambiguous on purpose because they, USA Basketball hadn't had any youth initiatives, by and large, aside from our junior national team, um, which he was even sort of new at that time. Um, but but unlike USA Hockey, US Soccer, other governing bodies, you know, we weren't in the youth space. We just focused on forming teams, or they just focused on forming teams for international competition. So the job was ambiguous because there there was no department, there was no division, there was no precedent. So I had I had applied for that, um, hadn't heard back for months, and and then randomly, right when I'm settling into that you know that GM position there in Massachusetts, I got a call uh, for an interview, and um, and that started me down a process of about a five month interview, four 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 to five month interview process. Um, as you pro both probably know, um, you know, we're governed by our board of directors. And so uh, making up that board of directors are uh, folks from the NBA, the NCAA, National Junior College, the AAU, National Federation of High School. So you go through those interviews, you know, with um, a subset of those groups uh, or representatives from those groups. And so it was a long process. And as I started to go through it, I started to realize, oh, they're actually looking to start an entirely new division here. And, and um, it's, it's the real deal. And um, I think probably why I um, ended up getting to this point because I know I'm for sure there are a lot of great candidates. I, I know that just as worthy and um, certainly just as qualified. Um, I think what made me as qualified anyway is that my experiences. So like I was telling you about 10 and 11 year old basketball through 
low-level club basketball, high-level club basketball, had some experience with the NBA, with the Celtics on the media side, um, <clears throat> had a cup of coffee as a, as a political communications consultant as well. So I think that maybe helped me along too. Um, and, um, and, and, and of course, you know, my education um, coaching side and some relationships I had made. Um, so I think that all went into it and made me a good candidate. And then, um, um, and then I think I ultimately got offered the position because I laid out a, 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 a pretty decent vision, I think, um, that, um, that we're still using today. Yes, that's what I was going to ask you is obviously when you're going through and you're talking to all those diverse groups, they don't all have the same necessarily vision or thought process for what they might have wanted this to be. So was a lot of the interview process just you talking through with them kind of what the vision was, whether that was your vision, their vision, a shared vision? Was that kind of what the process was like? That's exactly right. It was, it was a little, so when, you know, when you, you know, you typically go into an interview, um, particularly if it's a, you know, with a, with a high level company or something, there's a lot of information available that you can sort of read up on and, Hey, you know, what are they trying to do here? What have they done in the past? What would they like to do? Um, there was none of that. So a lot of it was, um, sort of open dialogue Q and A about what they wanted this uh, program to be. Um, the problem with that is you, you get that information while you're on the phone, so you can't really study up on it. So, <laughs> so, right. so the, the, the reaction to, um, to them, um, um, you know, could have been just telling them what they maybe wanted to hear. Um, and they all did have a little different idea of where this program could go. But so I kind of flipped it a little bit and said, look, um, I know people in that space. I know what the space is uh, calling for. These, this isn't my vision. This is the vision of, or a compilation of, of, uh, of all of our thoughts. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's no um, secret what's wrong with youth basketball. Maybe the secret isn't, or maybe the, uh, the plan on how to fix it can be disagreed upon, but we all know what the issues are by and large. And so I took it, I took that route during the interview process and I told them, look, this is what I, and when I say I, I mean we, the space believes the issues are. This is what I think, me personally, we could do to fix some of them. Again, I that's learned over time by speaking to folks like yourself and and others. And then um, you know, and and if and I and I put that out there and I said, if if you think that this will work, then I think I'm the right fit for here. And if you don't think this will work, then I'm probably not the person for you, because um, that's how I, that's how I would do it, and that's what I think needs to be done. And so, um, and I repeated that. I don't know how many interviews I went on. I, I, I spoke <laughs> with maybe eight, something like that. So I repeated it all eight times. And 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 um, and I, and, I, and for anybody that's out there listening, I and going through similar experiences or job you know, um, the job hunt or interview process, I think it's a great way to go because when, if and when you do get that position, you get it in an authentic, real way. And then when we do have challenges and strifes and things like that, you can always call back upon the fact that you, or you can always call back on honesty and, and, I, and, and, and authenticity. And I think that's who I showed during the interview process. And I think that's what I've tried to maintain. Um, and it's, and it's been pretty effective. And so I think ultimately that's why I am, blessed really and honored to be able to serve in this role. Absolutely. So I want to ask you off of that, what were some of the things that at that time, because obviously, as you said, there was no, there was no division here. There wasn't, there wasn't anything that you could go back to or point to and say, this is what was done in the past. So what were some of the things that you laid out at that time that you're starting to see come to fruition today mm -hmm. Now let's start there and then we can come back to maybe some things that you laid out that are still works in progress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the cupboard wasn't completely bare in the sense of um, we, we had some knowledge of some things that didn't work. And I don't know if you both remember this, but there was an organization called iHoops that was started back in 2007 ish, six ish. Um, and IHOOPS was a joint initiative between the NBA and the NCAA um, that was initially designed to fix some problems in, quote unquote, problems in youth basketball. And um, that organization, I'll come back to the organization itself, but it was started because USA Basketball um, back in 2002 um, lost and, and had a poor showing at the world championships on our own home soil in um, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I think we finished sixth or seventh in our own tournament at the FIBA, uh, uh, the World 
championships. Um, and then that led to 2004, which was the uh, Olympics. Um, we um, only obtained the bronze medal. Um, uh, but 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 bigger than that, at that point, there there was a little bit of a culture shift, or what um, some of the folks at the NBA and the N- NCAA had thought was a culture shift in basketball, um, and it needed to be uh, course corrected. And what came out of that was that I Hoops organization. Um, and so initially, back then, uh, if you um, probably remember this, that's when USA Basketball underwent a little bit of a change. Jerry Colangelo, who was the owner, or the former owner of the Phoenix Suns, came in as our chairman. Uh, and Coach K, Coach Krzyzewski came in as our men's national team head coach. Our women have been wildly successful for years. and um, But on the men's side, I'm speaking, which is probably right. one of our more notable programs, at least at least to the general public. Um, they they all thought that, that any youth development initiative should fall under USA Basketball. But David Stern, who was the commissioner of the NBA at the time, and Miles Brand, who was the um, uh, president of the NCAA at the time, decided that since the NCAA and the NBA had really never worked together before, um, that they would um, stick to forming this youth initiative, um, which they named IHOOPS. Um, and the interesting thing about IHOOPS, um, aside from the fact that it was supposed to fix a lot of the world's problems, is that it um, it was a for-profit organization. There was actually a, a few different organizations that they formed. There was a marketing division. There was sort of a digital um, property. Um, and then they, had a, then they had an office, an administrative uh, uh, office in Indianapolis. And so um, they received some funding from Adidas and Nike at that time, which at that time were the only two players sort of in, in basketball. Um, uh, the NCAA and the NBA both contributed some funding. Uh, I believe they hired about 20 people. Um, they spun up that office and, um, and they were going to figure out what they wanted to be. Um, and I tell you that story. Um, and then, and then a, a few years later, um, they had some great programs, um, really good people that worked for them. But I think what they lacked was a, was a vision and a game plan of who they were and what they wanted to be uh, before they went out into the space. And so anyway, um, the program itself didn't work out. It came full circle. It came back to USA Basketball, and David Stern had, you know, reapproached uh, or approached now Jerry Colangelo, and we took on that initiative. We sunsetted the iHoops brand. Uh, we inherited their what was left of their assets, so that would have been any partnerships and and their digital website. Um, we closed the office down, and unfortunately, some people, um, you know, lost their lost their positions but but we i think we they all learned from that was that we needed to do things differently so fast forward when i came in in uh late 2013 and really early 2014 my charge was going to look remarkably different than the ihoops charge first of all we weren't going to have the money that ihoops had because <laughs> it was coming off uh, some down times um right you know we weren't going to have a staff of 20 um, and we weren't going to just be allowed to throw some stuff against the wall and see if it sticks so we really had to come up with a with a with a pretty good game plan, and um, and essentially that's what I did my first year. So give us one thing that you came in with an idea that everybody that you talked to, or at least most everybody, was sold on saying, "Hey, that's a great idea. Let's let's get right to work on that." Um, that's an easy one. That was um, um, well to give you a little explainer, like. We, we weren't, again, I talk about resources, we weren't going to be able to um, have unlimited resources where we could go out and try to reach every child and every parent in the country. So the way to get to children and parents and to improve our game, and when I say improve our game, I mean, you know, like showing them you know, a better way to play the game, you know, less right. games, more, more, more focus on skill development, things like that. Um, but to show everybody to do that is going to be tough to reach those folks. So we identified early on that we would go through existing organizations to reach the coaches in those organizations to have an impact on as many children as we can through the coach. So by and large, everybody bought into the coaching component. And so um, I think you're seeing that now with our coach license program, which we launched in like really mid 2015. But if we can educate and train coaches and onboard them and have communication points with them, they're really the people that deliver the game. And everybody got behind that concept. And so that became our first program. Registration is now open at www.headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps this summer in Strongsville, Westlake, Avon Lake, Oberlin, Brunswick, Highland Heights, Mentor, and Hudson. 
At Head Start Basketball, we care deeply about making a positive impact on the lives of young basketball players, both on and off the court. It's through building strong relationships with our players, parents, and coaching staff that we are able to use the game of basketball to enrich the lives of those we interact with, both inside and outside of our organization. We believe that our attention to detail, our growth mindset, and our commitment to lifelong learning allows us to help our players achieve their fullest potential. We are passionately committed to providing players, parents, and coaches with everything they need to reach their goals. These core values run through everything we do. Check out our website, www.headstartbasketball.com, and discover why you should attend a Head Start Basketball camp this summer. Hope to see you there. So where are you in terms of the penetration of that program and getting coaches licensed? Like, where do you feel you are in that process in getting to as many coaches as you possibly can? Are you 25% there? Are you 75% there? Where do you think you are in terms of making sure that coaches are going out and doing that? Well, um, let's see. So if, um, I don't know if, um, if you have this stat, but um, we were uh, we work closely with um, the Aspen Institute and uh, their uh, Project Play initiative. And yes. the Aspen Institute will say that there are actually 2.5 million people coaching youth basketball in the United States. Um, and right now, of those two point, most of them are parent coaches, obviously, and volunteers and what have you. Um, right now, we have about 30,000 licensed coaches in our database. Um, which is about one, little over 1%. <laughs> so uh, we want all 2.5 million to have a coach license. Um, now we won't ever get there and that's okay. Um, but the, the, the premise is that we can provide an offering. Look, and, and, and by the way, I should uh, stipulate this, a coach license isn't gonna make you, you know, a hall of fame coach. It's gonna give all of us a base uh, level from which we can build upon. So. Um, and more importantly, it gives the organization that um, our children are playing in um, and, and the parents of those children some satisfaction that the coaches are at least background screened uh, monthly by the national governing body. They have some uh, child abuse um, and sexual abuse uh, training. Um, and then they have some base principles by how to communicate with young people, right? Like, like <clears throat> you know, teaching versus uh, criticizing, things like that. So um, that's, that's what it really is. And so, um, you know, for those 30,000, at least they belong to a community, a credible community, um, if not a qualified community of people doing things the right way. And I, I think um, that's that's our biggest takeaway from it. But we do want all 2.5 million. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm going to say two things. One, it's great stuff. Uh, when I first, I think I, this is my, I don't know, whatever, fourth year. I think I did it the very first year. So however many years the program's been in existence, um, you know, I jumped on board with it and Awesome. For any coach that's out there listening, it's it's well worth the time and effort and money that you put into it to be able to, A, associate with yourself with USA Basketball, but just from the quality of the content and what you're going to learn through that, even if you're an experienced coach, I think it's it's tremendously valuable. And so then the next question that I would ask you is, and this is the thing that I think if I think about how – I'd like to see youth basketball continue to change and evolve. And I think it's great that USA basketball is leading the charge. Cause I think it's the perfect organization that has nothing but the good of the game in mind. So I always find that the biggest challenge when you're trying to make a change is how do we continue to educate a coaches about the importance of getting it B how do we start to educate parents to let's say look for coaches who are licensed or who have the necessary background in order to be able to coach and obviously like you said a lot of the a lot of that 2.8 million are volunteer parent coaches and so that's always you know presents a challenge of how much time are those people going to be willing to invest in you know in coach education but i know i've talked to john o'sullivan from the changing the game project i don't know if you're aware of john but he he does a lot of <clears throat> he does a lot of work trying to again across all sports just educate coaches about the need for for education and organizations and one of his things is that he really believes and he's seen it work in different sports where when coaches are offered education and given you know a basic set of information kind of like what we're describing here it makes them 
want to come back and coach again because now they feel like they have some level of skill, some level of knowledge, some level of being able to do a good job for the kids, which is what they, you know, which is what they want to do. So what in your mind, what's the vision going forward for continuing to educate parents and coaches on the value of the coaching license? Yeah. Um, if I'm being completely honest, the vision is that um, we understand that those 2.5 million coaches are coaching within organizations that um, predominantly, not 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 all of them, but the majority of them have some sort of mechanism in place. Um, and I'm talking about like municipal leagues and boys and girls clubs and YMCA. So like people that have some level of accountability to someone, whether it be a board or a, you know, a town council or, or city council or something like that. Um, and so a lot of those coaches live and reside in those, um, in, in those uh, units. And so um, when we go to uh, promote the license program, um, you know, we, we, we try to sell them on, on the benefits and the value um, to them, right? Because there's a, uh, you know, a little less liability that you've got somebody else doing a, a, a thorough screen. It's by the way, our screens are not just like where you, you know, the equivalent of a Google search. These are like some pretty in-depth. Um, um, and as you 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 probably know, um, Mike, with you know, if you um, now that you've gone through it, it's um, gets easier every time you do it. But um, you know, we we go back a few years on your background screen. For sure. And we look and and we, you know, if you've had a cup of coffee in New York but you live in New Jersey, we're gonna we're going to know about it. And, um, um, you know, so, so, but to, 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 to back to your point, really there are three reasons why people want to do this, the coaching license program. It's uh, a, because they, uh, uh, they love USA basketball. They follow the dream team when they were a kid and they just want to be associated. <laughs> and that's, okay, right. that's cool. Um, we'll take those people. Um, B, uh, which is, which is sort of the organic reason they actually like the tools and the resources that we're putting out and they find value in it. Um, or C, somebody told them they had to do it. And, and whatever the, whatever your reason is, we'll take them all. Um, and, but by and large, the, um, folks that, you know, the, the, the people that adopt our program are the ones that do it because somebody it's a mandate basically. And so, you know, we go through existing organizations, but as we're, as we're trying to sell the license, what you can imagine what we hear back is, Hey, you know, we've had this great program. We do this for 20 years. We've vet all of our coaches or, um, look, I can't, I can't have my soccer coach doing one thing and my basketball coach doing another background screen. So, you know, then it's just a matter of time. Can we get them on the same background screen system? Um, things like that to adopt this. And, and, and it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate thing. You can't have the tennis coach doing one thing and the, and they coach basketball in the winter doing another. So they, they, they have their own screening program. So what we're looking to offer now is the next iteration of the license. And so um, for certain groups, uh, and this will this will be available this fall, um, look, if they're not going to adopt the license, um, you know, which which right now it's a lot of club programs, as you can imagine, and, and summer summer type programs that do it. Uh, but if they're not going to adopt the license, what else can we offer them? Can we at least offer them the base courses so that they can at least have the education and the training piece of it? Um, and, and, and we think we're going to be able to do that extremely affordably. But not only that, we think we're going to be able to do it dynamically. And so our e-learning program that we're uh, it's a certificate program that we're coming up with will be offered this fall to large scale groups that already have and can prove that they have a more robust vetting process of their own. And then they'll be able to come into USA Basketball um, and not only um, uh, be able to offer an e-learning program back to its in-house, you know, their league coaches, but they're going to be able to tell us what courses they'd like their coaches to take. So I'm getting long winded, but for example, uh, the Boys and Girls Club in New York, I'm just making this up, um, you know, they, what might be important to them is the safe sport component or some sort of safety component and a how to how to speak with parents, you know, of course. And so maybe their certificate is those two courses for that league. Maybe in Phoenix, Arizona, the league out there at the at the at the you know the, the YMCA league might be something different. It might be, yeah, the how to communicate with parents course, but it also might be how to fundraise or you know, something like that. I'm making it up. Um, and so we're looking at dynamic e-learning certification that we can offer to these people who they're not going to get the license anyway, but at least they can get some sort of uh, education and training from the governing body. Yeah, that's great. I think what you do there is also you get them in the door and mm -hmm. you get them exposed to the content, you get them exposed to 
what you guys are doing. You get them exposed to something that they may not have had any experience with before, and now they see the content, they see the value of it, and suddenly maybe they do want to come back and get more involved, whether that's through the license program or just you know getting on board with the guidelines and all that stuff. Uh, it just seems like it's a great way to go back to what my original question was about how do you continue to engage more and more people to understand the value of it. And I think that's one of the things that I'm still finding as, you know, as a coach who has a license and as someone who runs, you know, a summer camp program. And this year for the first time, to your point, is I've been mandating to the coaches that are going to work who are adults that are going to work for me this summer that they are, they're going to get their license. And I, I, you know, I've done it for the reasons that you described and I'm, I'm anxious for the day where that, that designation holds value, Mm -hmm. not just with the coaches and for the content, but where it also holds value for parents out there who say, Oh, I want to be involved with this program because their coaches are USA basketball certified. And where there's, you know, where there's that piece of it, where there's recognition of the program by, the parents. And I don't know how close we are to that or aren't to that, but I think you're starting to see it more. Let's put it this way. Compared to two or three years ago, I know <laughs> that there's way more people that are aware of that than there used to be for sure. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, I think the best call I ever received since being here, we get a lot of calls from a lot of people and you know, most of them are excited about their kid got invited to camp or, or something like that. And they should be, and that's great. But um, the best call we ever got was that uh, it was from a parent and um, her child was playing on a a court in a, you know, in a multi court uh, event space, I guess. Um, And and we got a call and it was a complaint and it wasn't even about her child, her son's coach. It was about a coach on a different court. And what she noticed is that coach was wearing their USA basketball license, loud and proud. And um, but what the coach did was he started to act up. He, he flipped out on officials. He was throwing chairs. He was doing, you know, just, you know, um, right. a little, yeah. but, you know, say, I, say no more. <laughs> yeah. And so um, and, and allegedly um, punched or brushed or pushed a player. I forget what it was. Now, we had no video evidence and we didn't have a name to go by. Um, but actually, we were able to find out what the event was, what time the court was. Uh, the game was and then go back to the schedule and the event organizer who by the way did not require the license this is in 2016 nobody had really required it at that time this was a guy that had done this voluntarily but because she noticed that he was a licensed coach she now had a place to call and i think that's a big factor that we can't overlook that um who did you call before yeah you could call the tournament operator if you could find out who they were and you know get a hold of them good 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 luck with that yeah, right. And and then don't forget who they take their check from, you know, and right. Uh, yeah, for exactly. sure. yeah, so so that was one of the best calls I'd ever received. And, and trust me, that was a cu- painful couple of days trying to pinpoint this coach. But it was important that we did. We revoked his license. Again, it didn't mean anything back then because nobody required it. Uh, right. him. Yeah. Um, but now it does. And now that the NCAA has required it for the coaches coaching in um, NCAA certified events, um, all all the NCAA uh, camp coaches, so that so their um, the kind of their um, academy um, uh, program um, are all going to be USA Basketball licensed, and like you said, there are others that are starting to um, uh, to look for it. But um, yeah, those are some of the best calls we received, despite the uh, you know despite some of the uh, unfortunate incidents that are being reported. Um, at least now there's accountability to somebody. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's just like anything when you're when you hear. Um, and when you hear about those incidents, obviously those are things that, you know, all of us find disturbing and we don't want basketball to be associated with that. And we certainly don't want, if we're parents or, you know, we don't want our kids to be associated with, you know, somebody who's behaving in that way. But to your point, by, by being able to have somewhere where they can go to to say, Hey, I observed this behavior and the fact that they have the respect for USA basketball and that they know that they can call and you guys took action. You know, that speaks a lot for what we're all trying to do here in the game, which is to make it better for the kids who are playing it. And that's really what it comes down to is you want to provide the best experience that you possibly can for kids. And I think that the coaching license program is certainly something that for the coaches who go through it, to you, what, like you said, it doesn't, it doesn't turn you from a novice coach who's never coached basketball before 
into someone that we're going to be seeing on TV coaching the Final Four or in the NBA. But mm -hmm. it certainly allows you to learn some things that can make a difference for an 8, 9, 10-year-old team of kids who are being coached by a parent volunteer or even a coach who has some experience. You're going to learn some great things by going through that program without, without question. We hope so. <laughs> so let's jump to um, – Something else is coming down the pike that uh, that I really believe in. And that's three on three basketball. Can you talk a little bit about where USA basketball is going with three on three? Because I think that's another thing that the public maybe isn't quite aware of yet of what's coming. And I'm just a big believer in three on three basketball for kids in terms of how good it is for their development for a whole bunch of reasons that we can get into. But just talk a little bit about what you're doing with USA basketball and three on three. Sure. Yeah. Three on three. I mean, we, we um, uh, I envision the three of us played it at some point, you know, whether it be, you know, at the old outdoor tournaments that they were popping up around the country um, back in the day uh, or just informally in our driveways or down at the playground. Um, but FIBA, uh, the International Federation, uh, has um, formalized it, made it a, a competition, a competition structure. And we're proud to report that it's now in the 2020 Olympic Games. So it's here to stay. And typically when that happens, when a discipline gets into the games, uh, there's a trickle down effect that you'll probably start to see it um, formalized at different levels, um, you know, whether it be college, high school. Um, but we've started to formalize it. And so about uh, six, seven years ago now, um, we started our own three on three program. Um, we held a couple of national championships, one at the U18 level and one at what we call the open division level, men and women, separate competition. Um, and yeah, um, the toughest part for us um, is trying to, so in this country, three on three basketball is seen more as a training tool for five on five. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but three on three has its own set of rules. So they have a 12 second shot clock, uh, continuous play where you take the ball out of the basket and keep going. Uh, no, no checking the ball up top uh, for after a score. Um, there's no coaching in three on three basketball. So the players um, like... Like Don Joe Walter, our coach development director, likes to say, you, you, you have to figure it out. Uh, it's, 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 uh, and they do. And remarkably, they do. And, and, um, and we like it from that perspective uh, because basketball, also as Don likes to say, is uh, overcoached and undertaught. And, and, and if you're a teacher of the game, uh, you're going to be able to see it real quick in three on three because your, your players will you, – you'll see how quickly you – you know, your players can do it on their own. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot, and there's a lot of different aspects. Size of the ball is a little smaller. Um, you know, they play on an outdoor court, so they play usually on a sport court. Um, um, you know, you can't foul out of the game, but you can only have four players. Um, so three and a sub. Um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, um, three on three fell under the youth division at USA Basketball back in uh really like 2014 when there was a vote to get the game to get the sport into the um 2016 games in rio and it and it fell through because they were having some logistical and building and site issues in rio at that time um and so what we decided to do was roll three on three basketball under the youth division to see if we could grow it organically that way and that was tough uh, i don't we don't think our country was ready for it um and so uh you may know this, we, we changed the name of our division from youth development to youth and sport development because because of three on three and because we run some programs for women as well. Um, and um, and now three on three is here to stay. And so it's under our division. And um, it, it's interesting because we have to, um, you know, I wouldn't say convince people, but we have to show them that three on three is a valuable opportunity as a player. Right. You get more touches on the ball. Um, you get to showcase what you can do. Maybe you showcase what you can't do as well. Um, but, but, but by and large, you can, you can showcase what you, what you can do and, and you can't hide, um, and, and you get to play the game. Um, the coaches, I think are a little, uh, they kind of have, you know, they're squinting through one eye at us. Like, is this real? You know, how do I, you know, what do I fit in here? And so that's been a challenge as well. Um, but I think you're going to see right after, uh, people see it on TV, um, that it's going to take off here domestically. So um, we can we can really get into three on three. There's um, uh, for the United States to get into the Olympic Games. There's a point qualification system, um, which is not as easy as people think. Um, and that's, only through, eight, that's through FIBA, right? That's through FIBA. Yeah. And only eight men's teams and eight women's teams are going to be are going to make the Olympic Games. And um, and you do that by virtue of earning points about a year and a half out from the Olympic Games. So. 
uh, we're right in the thick of it right now, um, trying to earn enough ranking points as a federation to get ourselves in a position to qualify um, for, for 2020. So when you look at the 2020 Olympic team, where is that pool of players being drawn from that's currently playing, trying to qualify the United States into Olympic three on three? Yeah. Um, well, if you two are available, we, right. we, could, we, could, we could add you to the mix, but it's not, it hasn't been easy. Um, and, you know, and, and part of that is because basketball in this country, the popularity of it is a blessing and a curse. Um, so, um, you know, on, on the blessing side, there are so many playing opportunities both here and overseas and um, uh, for uh, men and women. Um, and it's a curse because as you're trying to put this three on three initiative together, people are busy playing five on five. And so we have to work in and around what already exists. And um, now um, what we can say uh, definitively is that NBA athletes won't be allowed to take part in the point earning process, though uh, they're end up nor are WNBA athletes. Um, but um, in 2020, FIBA's left the window open so that um, a couple of players on your team um, won't have to earn, you know, X amount of points, but they'll have to earn a few points, um, and and perhaps they can they can be considered at least two of the athletes um, that weren't part of the circuit, you know, a year and a half prior. Um, so we're, we're, we're excited about that. So that's still an opportunity that may exist. But for the rest of us, um, we have to take part in the FIBA uh, system. And, and, and essentially, um, that happens the summer, uh, spring, summer and fall prior to any um, competition. So um, last year, it was uh, earning enough points to get into the World Cup. Our men qualified for this year's World Cup and our women did not based on that system. So going into next year, we have our work cut out for us. Um, we have to play on this circuit. Um, um, so the easiest way to say this is you have to get as many players as you can get playing, as many times as they can play in order to uh, uh, bring the United States points up to a level that we can be in consideration when the determination date is made for who will be in the Olympic Games, which is going to be November 1 of this year. So when and where is that circuit that these three on three teams are playing in? Yep. Um, uh, up until this year, that circuit had been held pr primarily internationally uh, in, in uh, Europe and Asia. Um, the Americas, um, North or South, they, we, we didn't really do much with three on three in the Americas, aside from our national championship. Um, and, and the highest point earning events are still happening internationally, although it's it's starting to change a little. So FIBA created what they call a world tour, kind of like a kind of like you would see for like a pro volleyball tour, if you will. And um, um, uh, people can form teams independently and they can go out and play in this world tour. And then based on your nationality, you would earn points for your country. So if the three of us and another substitute went and played uh, and we did well, um, we would earn so many points for playing in that event. But more importantly, we would earn our way to a higher level event for an opportunity to earn more points. And that's right where we're at right now. Um, we have our first, uh, we, we assembled, uh, we didn't we didn't want to rely on the space necessarily to assemble the teams. Um, although there are a couple of teams in the United States who are very good, who, 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 are, who are playing on the circuit right now. Um, but we just assembled the team to get out there and, and, and get started on that world tour. And our team right now is made up of a number of athletes that predominantly play in the G League. Um, so, uh, some names that you may know, Kenyon Berry, I played at Florida in College of Charleston, Sanjay Lumpkin, uh, played at Northwestern, um, uh, Kadeem Jack played at Rutgers, uh, John Octius played at uh, Purdue. Those four guys are en route as we speak down to, uh, Brazil to play in the first world tour event for them for the year. Um, if they do well, they would earn points, uh, and the United States would earn points. And, and also, more importantly, earn an opportunity to go on to a higher level event where they could earn more points. So uh, that happens between now and September. And then once all that madness is, is done, then, then uh, uh, teams that have enough points then go on to what they call a World Tour Final, which is the highest point earning event. And if you're in that event, you have a really good shot of, um, you know, either qualifying directly for the Olympic Games or qualifying for a, this is confusing, an Olympic qualifying tournament that would precede the Olympic Games to decide, you know, the last few spots. If you're a basketball coach in the greater Cleveland area and you have a passion for teaching the game and might be interested in joining the Head Start Basketball Camp coaching staff this summer, please reach out to us via email at headstartbasketball 
at USA.net. All right, so we're at a high level there with three on three. Sure. Obviously, if the game is going to continue to take off and become more visible, which through the Olympics I'm sure it is, Mm -hmm. then my next question would be how do we start to get the game more being used more at the youth level? Uh, Is there is there a vision from USA Basketball for getting more three on three being played, whether it's through the sponsoring of leagues or USA basketball three on three tournaments? What's the plan looking at it from the youth side of it as opposed to the elite side of it? Yeah. Um, right now, uh, because there's a U18 component to three on three um, at the international level, we've started there. Um, but essentially, we have regional coordinators throughout the country, and they're holding uh, what we would call like three on three series um, for people in their area. So basically, they open the gym up, uh, you know, once, twice a week, and they and they invite um, players into the gym, and then they form them into three on three teams each week, and they play a series for eight, nine, 10, 12 weeks. Uh, they record all of their results uh, in the FIBA platform, and then the players kind of get to track their point earning as well. But 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 what they don't realize is that they're actually working on their individual skills probably more so than anything, which is the most important piece to us. Um, so that's happening, and we've piloted that throughout the country for the last two years. This is Well, this is our second year. Um, we will probably formalize that here in the coming months. And so uh, your listeners and, 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 and folks out there will be able to um, essentially pick up a, a three-on-three kit, which is, which is essentially, um, you know, a set of rules, um, guidelines, how to play, uh, video, uh, things of that nature, um, where, where they can buy an official three-on-three basketball, stuff like that, and be able to implement either those series in their area um, but what we really hope to do at some point here is um, make a kit that perhaps would allow um, basketball, three-on-three basketball, to be played interscholastically. So, um, um, uh, and, and then the way we envision it is much like uh, high school tennis. So you'd have um, sort of teams, right? And and you would rank your number one, like you'd rank your number one or number Got two. Got it. Yeah, team. that's cool. That's yeah, very that, cool. That, yeah, that, is, that is very cool. Yeah, so that's coming. Uh, we we don't know if we'll have it for the fall. Uh, we're going to try to put it in the hands of a few leagues and see if they'll adopt it. But yeah, so then our schools could play each other, Mike. Where, you know, you, you maybe you only have two three on three teams, and I've got three. Okay, so you would weight the games as they're played, and then so just because your number one team beats my number one team doesn't mean I couldn't still win the match, if you will, because we could, you know, we could um, my number two team might be your number two team or what have you, and um, so. We look at it like that, and we particularly think it's going to be beneficial on the girls' side, where um, participation in girls' basketball has declined somewhat, as you probably are aware, um, whether it be tryouts for high school teams or what have you. Um, girls aren't leaving sports. That's the good news. They just happen to be leaving basketball. That's not that's the not-so-good news. So, But if you have a three-on-three uh, league at the high school level, most schools will be able to field, you know, one, two, or maybe even three teams, um, you know, and... We think it's great. We think it could be it has a lot of cost savings. You could you could commute to the games, perhaps you know in a car, as opposed to getting a whole bus. Uh, uniform expenses obviously lower, and 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 you know one court you can have six people play. Excuse me, uh, twelve people playing at once if you're playing half court on either side, whereas in a five on five game you can only have ten playing at once. So there's a lot of efficiencies. Um, I don't think event operators have figured out the formula yet to make it work for them financially, uh, but I think it's coming. And once they do, I think you'll start seeing it a little bit more maybe on the summer circuit as well. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I love that idea of, I mean, one, I'm just a big proponent of three on three for kids because I just think all the things that we've already talked about in terms of skill development, touches on the ball and spacing and all that good stuff. But I had never heard that the potential for it to be, you know, a scholastic event. And I think that, I think that's very cool. Would the vision be to have it, I don't want to say replace, but let's say a school would offer three on three or five on five, or do you think it might be, let's say you're playing your regular five on five high school season and then maybe three on three is a spring sport. Yeah. Or even, even maybe even like a fall thing. So gotcha. the best part, yeah, the best part about it though is, um, <clears throat> because of the games are only 10 minutes long or first to 21 they're so quick and, and i mean you're tired when you're done playing right. oh um, yeah um, um 
so you could have like a jamboree where you can have a bunch of schools come in, right? And 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 all play on a Friday night or a Saturday, or whatever. You can make it a big school thing, um, too. Um, and you don't have to maybe play twice a week, practice five times a week, whatever. You know, you can actually make it a shortened uh, deal. So and maybe you just use it as a warm up as you're getting ready for your five on five seasons because maybe some kids are playing other sports, right? So you're not going to have a full complement of of your players. So um, it's a great way to to look at it that way again we have not perfected it and we haven't even gone out there um, we've 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 um, tentatively run it by a few folks and i think there's some interest there uh, but it needs to be piloted and tried out but it, it, it in theory it should work yeah I, lo- I love it i think it's a great yeah. idea I, I can see my head's already spinning with some of the possibilities of things that uh you know, that you could do i really i really think it's a great idea i'd never heard that before in terms of the interscholastic competition so so i love that yeah, love, yeah, love sure. that, love that. Um, all right, I want to ask you about the uh, the her time to play program as well, because you've mentioned a couple times uh, what you're trying to do to keep girls involved in the game. So can you talk a little bit about that program, kind of its genesis, and then what it's all about and what the response has been? Sure. Um, well, the her time to play program is actually a is actually a junior nba initiative junior NBA, right yep. right we we have a program and, and it's a little different um ours is called women in the game um so you know kind of semantics i guess but um the difference would be that women in the game is really focused on getting women involved in careers in sport as administrators officials coaches and what have you her time to play is really more involved in getting young girls to participate in the game um on a regular uh, on, a, on a playing basis and the benefits of uh, the health and wellness benefits of um, and social benefits of playing the game. But good news is we do partner with Her Time to Play. Um, and so we know that that program is going really well. They just had started it off. Um, but we are a huge supporter of it. Um, we try to provide mentors and volunteers in our licensed coaches that are women um, to support the initiative. Um, and it's been successful. And with the NBA's might behind it, you know, uh, 30 teams playing 82 games a year, um, plus the WNBA teams playing. Um, they're a lot, they have a bigger megaphone, certainly, than we do, <laughs> playing once every four or two years. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, you know, so we, we we try to support that initiative as much as we can. Um, and then, and then but, uh, but on the Women in the Game initiative, it, that's a program that we started last year. Uh, piloted a couple of years ago, but really started it last year. And um, what we learned is that as we were starting up our camps and our clinics and our tournaments um, and, and our, our coach academy program, when we would go solicit speakers or coaches or clinicians, uh, there was a deficiency in the number of women that were um, available to us. Um, not that they weren't, it's just that the pool was a little smaller than it is on the men's side. So when we go to find a great female clinician, um, you know, they have to be, they have to be pretty good, number one, and they have to be willing and available. So um, when you have a smaller pool, you don't, you don't maybe get as many women. And so we could complain about it, or we could do something about it. And so we started our women in the game initiative to try to encourage more women to get involved in positions in sports so that we don't have, we can increase the pool, basically. Um, and it's been great. Um, it takes the form of a conference. Uh, a day and a half conference where you come out and you listen to different speakers talk about different topics. We have what we call uh, breakfast or lunch pods that uh, uh, the women will um, uh, get into circles and talk about different issues that affect them and their communities and some of their challenges that they see, maybe trying to get jobs and hired and move up or move up the ranks. Um, the attendees are primarily high school or college aged women. Um, uh, some young professionals as well, maybe some interns in their first year of um, work. And then, um, and we also manufacture a game that goes along with that. And what we do is an interactive experience. So let's say you want to get involved in event operations. Well, we take you around and show you what it takes to put on a game. Anything from soliciting officials to servicing sponsorships to concessions to ticketing to security. Um, and then the other group will go and follow the coaches and they'll shadow the coaches of that manufactured game um, and they'll take notes and, and they have a coaching mentor with them that talks about what the coaches could have done differently or better and the different styles that they um, either, you know, would want to emulate or not emulate. And so it's been great for us. Um, um, it's, we partnered this year uh, on our first one of the year with the Golden State Warriors. Um, and so we had great attendance and, and they were great partners. They provided some speakers and some, uh, they sent some people, um, 
to the conference um, and they paid for a few people to go. Um, um, and then and then after you leave the conference, there's a, there's a mentorship program attached to it, which we're really excited about. We pair um, women with people that are in women that are in the field um, with women that are looking to get into the field. And so they serve in a six to eight week mentorship program ongoing through USA Basketball. Yeah, that's terrific. I know one of the things that I always look at whenever you go to, you know, uh, whether it's a travel tournament, AAU tournament, you see rec league. You just see so few women coaches, especially at the youth level. Uh, there's just not, there's not nearly enough. And and I know that, you know, obviously there's a lot of men that are coaching women at, <clears throat> at all levels of the game. But I think that there's there's definitely something to be said for when you have a female coach coaching females, or even to take it another step further, when you have a female coach coaching males. And that's something that you. <laughs> You know, you very rarely see, and obviously they're, you know, you're starting to make some inroads in the NBA with Becky, some, Hammond. With Becky Hammond, and uh, yeah. we just heard. I was just in Chicago for the Junior NBA Leadership Conference, and uh, Jenny Busek from the the Mavs was there, and she was one of the cl- clinicians during the second day of the conference, and um, she was very, very impressive and very good, uh, you know, out there on the floor, and you know, putting the guys that were there to work for, her, putting them through their paces. So uh, it was great. It was great to see. Yeah, it was great to see. And you just don't see it. You just don't see it enough. And uh, I think that any any inroads we can make in that area to provide more opportunity for for women to, to get involved in the game obviously helps across all levels because, you know, they bring a different perspective. It's just a different way of, of looking at things. And I think that it's great to have role models for all different types of people. And it's, you know, when we only have – when all you see, if you're a young girl and you only see male coaches, uh, you know, you start to look at, well, what's the future for me in this game? Yeah, maybe I can continue to play through, you know, middle school or high school, or if I'm lucky, maybe I can continue to play through college. But there really isn't a path for me beyond that to get into coaching or get into administration. And so for you guys to be able to provide that pathway so that, again, young girls can see that there is a way for me to continue to stay in the game if I love it. I think that's tremendous that you guys are able to do that. Yeah, and then the other thing we try to do, um, again, there's a deficiency in the number of women coaching, obviously, and we think it's about maybe, um, uh, well, nationwide, the number of women coaching youth sports is only about 14%. We, our, our licensed database, well, um, our number of females that we have is closer to 20%, so we're, we're pretty proud of that. Um, again, like you said, a lot of those women are coaching men, which – which is good in one perspective, but what we actually look to do at our um, at our boys camps um, um, is to find women to coach within the boys camps because then also as young men are seeing women in leadership and coaching positions, um, that helps change the culture as well um, so that they come to start expecting it and that it's not an anomaly when you see a Becky Hammond or whomever um, coaching, but it, it becomes part of the fabric and that they're there because they're good they're good teachers and good and you know um, good coaches, um, and not not because you know um, <clears throat> you know it's it's uh, it's the fashionable necessarily thing to do, and so I think changing the fabric of of, of young men's minds too is will go a long way um, to help women's uh, causes in the sport. And and I think you saw that a lot too when they had that first women official ref the NBA. A lot of the yes. guys, a lot of the players didn't have any idea how to go about addressing her because, you know, I think they're a lot more comfortable now, but I think the first year that she was refing, you really definitely saw some drastic differences in the way that they reacted and addressed her because they didn't know what to yeah. do. It was Violet Palmer and Violet was um, our first speaker at our first women in the game conference. And uh, awesome. you're exactly right. Yeah. So you, you couldn't hit the nail on, on the head better on that one. Cause uh, we thought the very same thing and it was great to have her there to show her, to show the attendees, you know, <clears throat> some of the things that she went to to break down some of those walls. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely needed. And I think you, all, all around the things, all those things that we just talked about, I think are key points because we want to have, Again, you're you're excluding 50% of the population if you're if you're eliminating women from the opportunity to coach and be administrators at a high level or at a low level. Again, I think it's just yeah. as important to yeah. have women coaching third grade girls and third grade boys as it is to have Becky Hammond coaching on the San Antonio Spurs. It's you're you're still 
just as many people are seeing, you know, and being touched by those, you know, those women at those levels. Yeah. Uh, doesn't matter what level you're talking about. So that's that's tremendous. Yeah. All right. So what are some of the things? I know we've kind of already touched on some of the things that we're that we're moving towards. But if you look five years out, what are some of the things that you are hoping to accomplish? Or maybe some new things, uh, initiatives that are coming, uh, you know, coming down the pike here uh, as you look forward five years. Well, that's well, so we have a game plan, okay. And and if you were to sort of chunk it out into different categories, you know, we obviously talked about coaches, uh, players is a pretty obvious one. Administrators, I think, is 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 one that we were also, you know dabbling in uh, a little bit too you know we talked about going through existing organizations so we feel like we're on that path i think there the two next areas for us would be um uh, officials uh so help hoping to be able to standardize and i'm not talking high school officials necessarily but you know youth basketball officials um standardizing the way rules are administered um, and part of that is standardizing uh rules and some guidelines which as you know we uh, started that mission in 2016 with the uh, NBA, with a partnership and creating uh, new youth basketball guidelines. Um, we need to take that to the next level. So that'll be a part of that. Um, and I, we think officials will be instrumental in helping us carry that out. Um, but unfortunately right now there is no, um, anyway, national certification to be a youth basketball official. Um, so when you go to one league, you grab whoever it is and, and they be Put a whistle and a shirt on them and they're and they're the youth official or they're the you know they're the high school official right that's refereeing a youth game on a on a Saturday. Right. Um, so I think standardization of officials and of course um, rule sets for youth true youth basketball will be um, you know kind of the next frontier and then um, and then we talked about this briefly um, it's parents um, what can we do to reach those people that are either driving their children to games um, or buying them their basketball sneakers or paying for their uh, Gatorade as it were, or whatever the case might be, um, or paying for them to enter camps or tournaments or clinics or club teams. So um, we think that there's a untapped opportunity there. Um, I guess, I suppose with every opportunity comes a challenge in, in, in a lot of cases. So um, uh, the challenge is obviously identifying them and then opening, getting them to open up to us um, without us having anything really um, to hold uh, over them in terms of like, you know, we can't take away their playing time. <laughs> we can't pull their license and nobody needs one to become a parent. So um, what, do, what do we need to do? And and um, and that's going to be a real challenge for us. And, it, and it will, we'll, we'll take all of those five years, if you don't mind, to try to. Uh, Absolutely. But um, but but I think by developing good partnerships, um, we have a great relationship with the NBA um, and we think that uh, they will be a great partner. We mentioned they have a megaphone that we don't have and um and we think we can get there and, and and like you said mike we started to see this happen already we've started to see some parents inquire about more standards and they want more and they expect more um, from their child's coach um, and um, that's a good thing and so hopefully they see us as a resource and they start to come to us and that will help with our outreach as well yeah i think as more people just become aware of the work that you're doing i think that it becomes easier it's like you're you eventually i think reach a tipping point where you become more well known as opposed to being less known for lack of a better way of saying it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it just becomes the standard that everything is done by and everything is judged by and so if you're not a usa basketball licensed coach or you're not a usa basketball licensed tournament or you're you know you're involved in a program that doesn't have usa basketball licensing i think the goal and obviously what we want to do is see where parents are looking for that that it, it becomes it becomes a stamp of approval it becomes something that is the standard that people expect and again i think we're i think we're on the way to that like i said i've seen it grow in the last three or four years from where there was almost zero recognition of usa basketball other than what we talked about at the top, the dream team and the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And now I think they're starting to become a realization among people that it's more than that. And I think that's a great, I think that's a great, great thing. I want to wrap up by asking you one final question. And that is if you could do wave a magic wand and 
change one thing about the youth basketball landscape, what would that one thing be that if you could say, all right, we, I can instantly make this change, what would that one change be? Uh, for me, that one's pretty easy. I think it comes down to um, <clears throat> changing perspective. And I, and I think that comes down to putting competitiveness into perspective that um, we're all not out here to outdo each other, despite, you know, maybe what our um, <clears throat> civilization has become, um, <laughs> that we should all be out here uh, attempting to, um, you know, get our children involved in sport whatever sport, basketball or what have you, for the right reasons. And so if I could wave a wand, um, that would be my, um, that, and that is our goal, it, it would, which it's going to take a while. We're waving that wand. It's a big wand and we're waving it over a period of time. But um, it's to change the mindset a little bit from looking up at that scoreboard to decide if today was successful to looking um, and talking with my child on the way home to decide if it was a, if it was a fun, successful day for them. And... Um, uh, again, it's a big wand, and we're going to need a lot of people to help us wave it. Um, but that would be our goal, and it is our goal, and, and we'll get there. Yeah, I love that. I think it goes back to basically covers the entire conversation of what we talked about tonight because I think you can shift the perspective of the player and why they're playing. I think you can shift the perspective of the coach and why they're coaching and what becomes important to them at different levels. And then – Obviously, as you just mentioned, you can shift the focus of the parent in terms of what is their child getting out of the game of basketball? What are we using the game to be able to do? And I see it all the time, and I think it was a great suggestion. I think it's a great thing that I would agree with, that if we could change the way people look at what basketball and youth sports are supposed to be about and what they're supposed to do for our kids not as basketball players, but just as human beings, we would all look at it quite differently. And I think as you as you go through the process and your kids get older and you know, I've kind of not my oldest is now in ninth grade and as I've gone through it, you your perspective does change in terms of what you what you think they're they're gonna get out of the game and what's important to you that they get out of the game. And it's different for every kid. And unfortunately we try to put everybody into the same box of you know, we're trying, there's some end game that we're all chasing instead of enjoying the experience and using the game as a vehicle to make better people that are going to have a positive impact on society. And I think if we could do that and that big magic wand that you guys are lifting up and trying to wave over the basketball community, I think is, is tremendous. Cause if we can get there, everybody would be much better off. And also our game would be a lot better off. Completely agreed. I'm, I'm glad we all share the same perspective. No question. All right. Before we get out of here, Jay, I want to give you a chance to share how people can connect with you, how people can find out more about some of the programs that we talked about tonight. And then if there's anything else that we didn't hit on that you want to share before we wrap things up, you can go ahead and do that now as well. Well, that's awesome. I, we, Mike and Jason, I, we appreciate the opportunity. And, um, you know, I think immediately – uh, the two programs that I would, you know, we, we talked about this before, but um, <clears throat> we try to impact uh, or reach as many coaches as we can to impact as many kids as we can. So we think our Coach Academy program, which is about to tip off here, it's uh, fifth year now, uh, will kick off in June in Los Angeles. And then we go on to stops in uh, Atlanta and D.C. Um, and Dallas. And so and a couple of other stops, too. So um, I would encourage everybody to go to USAB.com to check out a location that's coming to your region. Uh, there'll be six of them on the docket this year. We're hoping to spin up, uh, make that eight actually. Um, but um, those, those are really great. They're day and a half events where people come and network and, and, and listen from uh, to, to both high level coaches or notable coaches, if you will, and, and um, all the way down to coaches coaching in local um, community middle schools that have, uh, all, of, all of them have some information to relate both on the court and off the court. Um, X's and O's strategies and all, but also philosophies and culture um, talks. Um, and then the second program, I would encourage everyone to take a look at uh, talking about club teams and travel teams. We do run a one event every year. It's called the U.S. Open Basketball Championships. Um, this will be our third year. Um, we uh, have run it every year and we'll be back this year in Westfield, Indiana at the uh, Pacers Athletic Center. So that'll be July 17th through the 21st. Uh, space is filling up fast, but we have divisions for 12U. 13U, 
ninth grade and 10th grade. Uh, we didn't do a 14U division this year because we're deferring that uh, division to the junior NBA and their junior NBA global championships. Uh, so either, and you can also go to usab.com to find out more about both of those programs. Um, so either if it's the US Open, uh, the junior NBA global championships, if you have a team and you're in those age or grade categories, we'd, we'd love to have you take part. I think both of us, the NBA and, and, and USA basketball, try to provide a different experience. Uh, not, it's not just about getting your games and going home, uh, but we all have uh, off-court elements and, and, um, and life skills and uh, player cookouts and ap player appearances and things like that. We try to make it a little different than maybe what some teams are used to, but it, it is the experience of a lifetime. We want people to experience that difference with us. I love it. Love it. And can people reach out directly to you or is they best off going through the USA Basketball website? Yeah, the best the best way. Well, email us any questions. The, the email address is youth at usabasketball.com. Uh, that's for any program. Um, our staff here is excellent at getting back um, and answering questions. Um, the website will provide a lot of answers too. But if there's intricate answers that you need, um, you can email you can email that youth at usabasketball.com. You can tweet at us. So it's at USAB Youth, um, and we'll get back to you that way as well. Um, and yeah, I think I think a lot of our programs you can find on our social channels on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, what, what have you. Um, and uh, we're eager. This this is a, this is a community that we're eager to be a part of. Um, we're wrapping our arms around a community that we haven't been in in 40 years. Uh, so so we try to do that with the um, with the player in mind uh, as a, as our customer, if you will. And um, and so we're excited to hear from anybody and everybody about everything and anything. Absolutely love it. Jay, we can't thank you enough for coming on tonight and spending an hour and 15 minutes or so with us, uh, sharing a lot of great information about what you guys are doing there with USA Basketball. I'm excited to see what the future holds. There's a lot of great programming that you guys are already doing that are going to continue to build, and then some of the new things that we talked about tonight with the three-on-three -three and what's coming with that I'm super excited about. So thanks for jumping on the podcast tonight with us. We really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls, ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.